I'm going to officially begin. Uh, it's really good to be together after such a long break. And I can see lots of people I recognize from our in-person programs at the Natural History Museum. And if there's any newcomers here, welcome. I'm Teresa Fanuki, and I serve as the program's chair for Santa Barbara Audubon, and I'll be hosting tonight's program. So as most of you probably know, this is our first virtual program, and we have a great presentation to share with you. Uh, Benny Jacob Schwartz is back. He presented last year, April 2019, and he's put together another educational and entertaining presentation full of his beautiful photography. We're very fortunate to have him kick off our program's season. We'll introduce him in a little bit. I have a few tech notes. You came in, uh, the meeting automatically muted, and I think it's great to spontaneously all say how to, hi to each other like we, like we did. That was, I love that. Um, and it sounds like everybody's re-muted, so please stay muted throughout the presentation from this point on. And I see a lot of you noticed, uh, figured it out already, that we inadvertently set all participate, participants' videos to off upon entry. If you'd like to start your video and don't quite know how, and you want people to be able to see you, you can go to the toolbar. It's usually in the bottom left-hand side of your screen and click Start Video. There will be an opportunity for Q&A with Benny following his presentation. Please use the chat function to communicate. Uh, chat is at, usually at the bottom of the screen on most devices. You can click on chat um, at any time, a window will pop up and you can then type in your question and submit it. And I'll be monitoring the chat and will convey the questions to Benny during the Q&A. David Levishev Shep is providing tech support for this meeting. David is off in our tech. Uh, support in 3D in Fair and Auditorium. Many of you know him well, and we really appreciate David and his tech savvy. So now let's go to our president, Dolores Pollock, for some brief chapter announcements. Thank you, Teresa, and welcome everyone. We're excited. Our first uh, fall program is by Zoom, and we have loads of participants, and so we're happy about that. Uh, over the summer and since we met last, a lot of planning and meeting has gone on. All the meetings have been on Zoom. Uh, we discussed field trips and bird walks and when we might be able to resume them. We looked at getting these programs uh, online. Um, a lot of time has gone into thinking how we can best care for our rescued raptors at the Audubon Aviary at the Natural History Museum. And of course, first and foremost, how to keep everybody safe. So we're working on all those fronts. Uh, you may have seen in our last electronic blast, which went out last night, that there is a way to watch birds at home and participate in a big day. That date is October 10th and 11th. So it's something you can do for as long as you like, wherever you are at your own pace. And you can read more about it on our website, which is santabarbaraaudubon.org. We have several meeting of several openings on our Audubon board. So if you're interested in joining the leaders of this chapter, write to me, Dolores Pollock at president at santabarbaraaudubon.org. I would love to hear from you. We meet monthly and I want to give a special welcome to our newest board member, who is Rob Lindsay. Rob actually is back. He was the president quite some time ago <laughs> in the 90s. Anyway, back to you, Teresa, and thank you for all your organizing for tonight. And thank you, especially to Benny, for being here. Thanks, Dolores. Okay, let's intro Benny. Benny Isaac Jacobs Schwartz, that's a mouthful, also known as Beegis, works seasonally as a naturalist, expedition trip leader, and international bird guide. Most recently, his work has been in coastal Alaska, Trinidad and Tobago, and the Ecuadorian cloud forest. While he's back at home in Los, Los Angeles, Benny leads public and private birding adventures to urban hotspots, hot 
where he inspires others to conserve the open spaces around them and look up more often from their phones. He is also a passionate photographer specializing in birds. He currently serves on the board of the San Fernando Valley Audubon Society. He is owner and operator of Birds by Beegis, which he'll tell us more about. Benny, we sincerely appreciate you presenting for us. So take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Teresa. And uh, thank you for having me. I'm definitely honored to uh, kick off your guys' uh, presentation series. And uh, of course, super grateful to be back. Um, although not in person, I may have to come up with another presentation so I can join you guys in person next time. But rest assured, this will do for now. And yeah, thank you to the well over 80 plus participants who are tuning in from their homes. Um, it's a real honor and privilege, like I said, to present for you guys again. Um, and it turns out I really enjoy doing this type of work. So I'm going to pull up my presentation and then share my screen with you guys. And we will kick some things off. So before we get into things, um, just wanted to share a couple quick things. So um, there'll be a mix of different media in this presentation. Uh, a good majority of it is from myself, um, including some video and still images. And then there's other uh, media featured from other photographers and other awesome videographers. So um, if there's no photo credits on it, it's, it belongs to myself. And if there are photo credits, then they're either from some researcher friends or from other talented videographers or photographers. So probably wondering why I've gathered you here this evening. It's a really good question. And that is because we are going to be talking about hummingbirds. If this is news to you or you're looking for the Lebowski wedding, that is in a different Zoom channel. And I don't have the login for that, but we will move right along. And tonight's presentation is called The Marvelous Hummingbird. And uh, from Sea to Summit, and like Teresa shared, my name is Benny Jacob Schwartz, and I do a variety of things. And I will share those things briefly. So one of the things that I've done recently um, is kind of launch a small but intentional nature-inspired clothing brand to entice, excite, and shift the paradigm about bird watching and nature connection in general. Um, and so this is what we call threads. And then, uh, like Teresa also mentioned, I do bird and ecology walks uh, throughout the state of California and now mostly local since I'm um, actually back living in Los Angeles full time. Um, so this was a walk up in uh, Lake Merritt in Oakland, California. And then I was, I've also developed this uh, corporate team building program, um, which allows folks to connect to nature, uh, specifically birds, and under kind of the premise of mindfulness and nature connection, and using that to catalyze a shift in consciousness, even in our most urban areas. So a lot of listening by ear and sit spots and deep kind of practices that help evoke a greater appreciation and sensory awareness of our local area. Um, but that's obviously on hold. And <laughs> what isn't on hold is this awesome presentation. And so for our time together, I'll be kind of going broad, talking about kind of the history and the evolution of hummingbirds. And then we're going to dive a little bit deeper into some of the more specifics, including adaptations, their biology, um, and so on and so forth. So this presentation will be between four to six hours. So hopefully everyone has all the snacks they need. Wait, that's a different presentation. No, this one will be about 50 minutes. Um, so we'll hopefully keep it going. All right. So what makes a hummingbird a hummingbird? Well, glad you asked. Is it their evolutionary history? Perhaps. What about their distribution? Or what about their role as pollinators? Or maybe it's their amazing ability to fly. What about their size? Well, it turns out we're gonna talk about that today. Now, we have roughly 360 different species of hummingbirds and all of which are found in the Western Hemisphere. And as you can see here, there's quite a smattering of hummingbirds. We have a velvet purple coquette, a oh, velvet purple coronet, excuse me. We have a white necked Jacobin here. We have a ruby topaz. We have a copper rumped hummingbird. We have a tufted coquette female. We have a black-throated mango. We have a gorgeted sun angel and a Gould's jewel friend. 
And these are just eight of the 360 species of hummingbirds. And as you can see, their colors often match their very gaudy and uh, magnificent names. And like I said, hummingbirds are only found in the New World, which is kind of a misnomer, but that's another presentation. But regardless, they are found in the Western Hemisphere. And so we're going to dive into really the quantity and the diversity of, of hummingbirds found in each of the following locations. So we're going to kick things off in North America. So in Canada, we have around five species of hummingbirds that have been reported or that you could potentially see. And then in the United States, that number jumps up rapidly to 27. And then as we get even further south and towards the equator um, in Mexico, we have around 59 different species of hummingbirds. That's quite a bit. And uh, it, that number is going to increase as we continue making our way towards the equator. Now we've got a zoomed in map here of the Central American countries. And uh, we're going to kick things off so you guys can see how the hummingbird biodiversity uh, corresponds to each of these countries. And so you can see, even proportionally, even though Belize is much smaller than Honduras, it's still got quite a few hummingbird species. Guatemala's got 38, El Salvador has 26, Honduras 43, Nicaragua has 36, and then as we get real close to the equator, we've got Costa Rica with 51, and Panama with the highest in Central America with 59 species. And you thought things were getting good. Wait till we get to South America, folks. So Colombia has a whopping 165 species of hummingbirds currently recognized. And I'm not going to name them all, but I will name the next couple. Ecuador is not far behind with 133. Peru holds it down on their own with 125. Venezuela is not doing bad in terms of hummingbirds, 99 different species. And as you can see, the numbers are holding steady throughout South America. And then places like Argentina and uh, Paraguay, which are much further south, um, have noticeably fewer hummingbird species. And that is because it's farther away from the equator, which actually hummingbirds all emanated from a tropical origin. And uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Now, the evolution of hummingbirds, where did they come from? Well, really good question. And it turns out, after some research, Hummingbirds are most closely related to swifts. So here is a cladogram and basically shows the evolutionary branches. And as you look on the right hand side, we have apodiforms and then apodi, which are basically like tree swifts and are kind of standard swift, like boxes swift or chimney swift. And then on the right, we have trochilidae, which is the hummingbird family. Now, really driving home that graphic there. And some of you at home may be wondering, oh, really? And my answer for you is, oh, really? And that is actually proven based on a 52 million year old fossil that was found in Europe, which uh, was conclusive evidence of the swift and hummingbird common ancestry. And the two, and basically this fossil that we see here is basically a relic of our modern apodiforms. And what I mean by that is that this fossil was basically, if we're looking at the evolutionary timeline, this fossil basically represents a snapshot in time before, humming, before hummingbirds and swifts kind of diverged into separate families. And so that fossil basically signifies this the prior to the divergence of these two families. Now, as we get back to our fossil slide, we can continue moving forward. Now, another aspect that is really noticeable in a lot of hummingbird species is a, some, is a term that we call dimorphism, and it's sexual dimor dimorphism in this case. And a lot of birds also have this, um, but it's often most notable in hummingbirds. Now, on the top, we have a booted racket tail. This is a male. And then below it, you can see the bill length and the head shape is still pretty similar, but it has a much different coloration, and obviously, it does not have that really beautiful racket tail. Um, another striking example is a male ruby topaz and the female ruby topaz. Um, so one thing to note. Now, as far as their adaptations, um, one of the things that they're known for is that they're specialized nectarivores. Um, and what that means is that they are uniquely evolved to drink and feed upon the nectar, um, the sugary substance produced by flowers. As you can see here, this Allen's hummingbird is gorging on this uh, Cape honeysuckle photographed here in Los Angeles County. And 
They are also co-evolved with ornithifolious flowers. I'm sure you understood a lot of that, but in case you didn't understand the ornithifolious, it basically means flowers that love birds. And this is a sword-billed hummingbird photographed in the Paramo and upper cloud forest of Ecuador. And as you can see in the next image that pops up, that this flower is actually one of the main flowers that the sword-billed hummingbird is visiting. And as you can see from this cross section, it has a really long corolla, um, which is basically this long tube that separates the petals from the lower part of the flower, which holds um, the nectar, and it's also where the ovaries are. And so as the hummingbird comes in to drink the nectar, it has to stick its beak all the way into the back of the flower to access the nectar. But along the way, it gets dabbed in the face by these anthers, which are uh, contain the male gametes or the pollen from the flowers, and then it dabs it on there. And as they continue, obviously visiting other flowers, they are doing the flowers dirty work and pollinating them. And now what's so fascinating about that is that in the tropics, there are 7,000 different species of plants that are pollinated almost exclusively by hummingbirds. Now, if you compare that with the numbers in North America, we have roughly 125 species of flowers um, that are pollinated by hummingbirds. Now, you may be wondering, why is there such a disparity? And the reason is because of the botanical diversity disparity. Now, in tropical regions, if you've ever gotten to visit places like that, you'll know that there are so many plants and so many hummingbirds. And although California does have roughly 25% of the biodiversity of North America, um, we still harrow it. We don't harrow in comparison to uh, tropical locations. Now, we're gonna dive into some hummingbird biology and adaptations with this uh, long-tailed sylph, which is a very beautiful hummingbird found in Ecuador also. Now, speaking of adaptations, think about this. If our bodies ran the same way as hummingbirds, we'd have to roughly eat 1,300 sandwiches a day. Now, I have a big appetite, but there's no way I could eat that much. Well, Obviously, hummingbirds don't eat sandwiches, but what do they eat? Well, for sure we know they consume a lot of nectar. And you can see here on this tufted coquette male photographed in Trinidad and Tobago, this little donut or little ring of pollen um, that it collects on its bill from this little vervain hedge. And you can see that it's visiting this vervain and grabbing some nectar. Now, there are several ways that they actually get enough nectar in their lives. And one way is actually called territory defending. So this is a bladder pod. This is a California native plant. Um, it blooms year round. It's a beautiful addition to a garden. And sometimes hummingbirds will actually just defend a bush like this that's blooming. They're gonna hold it down and make sure that all the other hummingbirds stay away. That's a good way. Another way that we commonly see uh, hummingbirds dominating and maintaining uh, or maintaining their caloric needs by nectar consumption is the process called trap lining. Now this is different than um, other forms of nectar consumption because these hummingbirds are actually basically circling through the forest. And so they go from plot A to plot B to plot C to D to F to G to H and they just make a circle or they follow a specific pattern. And so they hit each flower, they hit each bush and make their way because as the, as the nectar is refilling in the flower, they're on to the next flower. They drink them and then go to the next flower. So rather than having to compete with other hummingbirds, they basically just kind of have their little path like their paper route and they stick to it. So this is a white tip sickle bill. Um, this was photographed by a dear friend of mine and talented biologist and conservationist named Sean. Um, and as you can see, this is one of the most uniquely adapted hummingbird bills. Um, to feed obviously on flowers that have a very similar shape, um, kind of analogous to our sword-built hummingbird, how drastic that evolution is. Um, here's an example of a green hermit visiting a very commonly trap-lined flower. This is a, I believe a species of Heliconia. Okay, so we got a couple of those ways out. Now another way that hummingbirds maintain appropriate caloric levels or you know, their, their metabolism is through the consumption or eating of invertebrates, like insects. 
Now I'm gonna play this little video and see if you can observe what this hummingbird is catching. We'll play that one more time. So if you missed it, look really closely. In the frame here, there's gonna be a very small little mosquito or a gnat that the hummingbird uh, basically hawks out of the air. Locking in, boom. Now, some of the invertebrates that mosquitoes love to eat, or <laughs> that hummingbirds love to eat are mosquitoes, ants, gnats, and aphids. And just recently today, I was leading a hike, and I actually saw an Anna's hummingbird perched inside of a cactus fruit, like, and the fruit had actually split open, and there were bees, and there were wasps eating the sugary fruit, and then the hummingbird had actually gone into the fissure of the, of the cacti fruit, and was actually, like, drinking up the sugary uh, flavor off of the fruit, which I had never seen before. So hummingbirds are extremely adaptable and they'll do whatever it takes to get their, cal get their calories. Um, and sometimes they get too carried away. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen a hummingbird hawking insects out of another, out of a spider web. Um, this or we were actually caught an Anna's hummingbird in its net, potentially as it was trying to hawk some insects out of its net, out of its web. Now, a really special way that hummingbirds also get enough calories is by sap well visiting. So you may recognize this beautiful uh, woodpecker here. This is a red-breasted sapsucker. And the sapsucker visits our range in the wintertime in Southern California. They're coming back, and they should be back pretty soon. And you may notice in eucalyptus trees like this one or pepper trees, often these kind of quarter-inch to half-inch holes kind of uh, basically drum into the side of a tree in a very mechanical and uniform kind of lining. And these are actually what we call sap wells. And they're excavated by these woodpeckers as they slam their beaks into the, into the tree until they basically hit gold, which is the sap. And so as the sap runs out, the, humming, the, the woodpecker grasps on with its, with its very strong feet and its really hard tail feathers and it presses against there and it laps up the sugary nectar, or the sugary sap. However, it visits a variety of different wells. And so maybe as the woodpecker flies off, somebody else might take notice, including a hummingbird or a warbler. And you can observe in the wintertime at an active well, sometimes warblers like yellow rumps and Anna's hummingbirds will come in and actually drink the sugary sap as well. So they are very adaptable and very sneaky. Now, another interesting thing to consider is how they achieve their amazing flying. Now, hummingbirds are unique amongst birds in that they can basically fly in all directions. They can literally fly vertically, they can fly backwards, forwards, sideways. They are marvels to observe, as I'm sure many of you can attest to. Now, here's a little video I snapped from UC Santa Cruz's Arboretum. This is a Banksia. This is a non-native uh, Australian flower or flowering bush. And uh, take note and see if you can observe how they're achieving that flying. How are they able to hover in place like that? So as you can see, it's slowing down here. You can maybe get a little bit better of a glimpse. Now it's back to high speed. So what I'll show you again in the slow-mo is that the, the birds are actually flapping their wings in a figure eight pattern. And so that on both the downstroke and the upstroke, that the birds are actually achieving enough lift to stay in place. So watch closely and see if you can observe that when it goes to slow-mo. Hard to see, but it's happening. Now, next up, we are going to talk about hummingbird tongues. Now, hummingbirds have amazing tongues. And there's more that meets the eye, just like we talked about with their amazing flying ability. So this is, a, this is some footage of white neck Jacobin I shot in Trinidad and Tobago. And this handsome male was just sticking out his tongue and I wanted to show you guys what it looks like. Now we covered their flight, we covered their um, nectar consumption abilities, including how they lap it up. 
but we haven't really dove into their adaptations for sight yet. Well, this is a perfect segue. Now, as I'm sure you can imagine, vision plays an absolutely essential role in hummingbird feeding and hovering behavior. And there's one thing in particular that's responsible for this behavior, and it's called the high retinal neuron density. And don't worry, we're gonna unpack that right now. Now, what does that even mean? Well, the retinal neurons serve to basically transform the optical image, so what's being seen, to extract biologically relevant info relating to light intensity changes and changes in time and chromacity. So the takeaway here is that retinal neurons help the hummers do what they do. And, um, and just to be clear, the retina is basically a small part of the eye. And so the neurons are basically processing the information that is being uptaken by the hummingbirds and allowing the hummingbirds in split seconds and milliseconds to basically decide and navigate. Because if you've ever seen a hummingbird diving and dashing or chasing each other through the thickets or in the jungle, you can only imagine how adept and how powerful their vision has to be to basically navigate. Um, if you've ever seen Star Wars when they go shoot the Death Star and the X-Wings, um, I kind of liken their dexterity and flying ability to uh, those crazy pilots. Now, energy requirements and metabolism. Now, this is a really important thing that we touched on briefly in the beginning, um, talking about the amount of food that the hummingbirds would have to consume if it was translated to humans eating sandwiches. Now, it is true that while hummingbirds are flying, they actually have the fastest metabolism of any animal other than insects. Enjoy this footage that I captured from Tandiapa Bird Lodge in Ecuador when I was working as a, a birding guide over there. And here's some slow motion video I captured on my GoPro while out in Trinidad and Tobago. And as you can see, white neck Jacobins. And then here's another shot I got on my iPhone that I put in slow motion of these booted racket tails um, hitting this beautiful flower for some nectar. Now, it's interesting because like we said, they are extremely adept flyers and they actually beat their wings really quickly. Now, what allows them to beat their wings so quickly is actually their high metabolism. So pictured here, we have a blue-throated mountain jam or blue-throated hummingbird uh, found in Mexico and in Southeast Arizona where this was photographed. And their heart rate reaches a possible 1,260 beats per minute and roughly 250 breaths per minute. Now, these stats were actually observed specifically in a study done on blue-throated hummingbirds, and the oxygen consumption per gram of muscle tissue in these hummingbirds is 10 times higher than an elite athlete. So we have Usain Bolt here, who's obviously a stupendous athlete, and we have this sparkling violet ear, who certainly gives Usain Bolt a run for his money when it comes to oxygen consumption per gram of muscle tissue. Now here's a white-eared hummingbird photographed in Oaxaca, Mexico, pre-COVID. And the question here is, how do, how do hummingbirds maintain that metabolism? I mean, that is, that's crazy, 10 times faster? Well, the answer here, is in direct oxidation. So here's a velvet purple coronet, or a couple of them, on some video that I, some video B-roll I grabbed while I was in Ecuador. And what I mean by direct oxidation is that the sugar consumed in the form of glucose um, from flower nectar can actually be con converted extremely quickly into ATP, which stands for adenosine triphosphate. Now, if you remember that from your high school biology or from your uh, higher level education. Um, this is a form of basically convertible sugar that muscles and animals can turn into basically kinetic energy. And so this sugar can be converted quickly into ATP or usable energy in just 30 or 45 minutes. And so it can also be stored as fat. And so here is a, a transitioning young adult male and as hummingbird. And one way that this sugary nectar can be utilized as a fat is in one species called the ruby-throated hummingbird. Now, if any of you guys have birded the East Coast or maybe you're from that region, 
you probably know the Ruby Throated Hummingbird very well. And that's because, well, it's really cute and it's the only hummingbird on the East Coast, reliably. Um, so we're gonna share a little case study about the Ruby Throated Hummingbird. Um, again, this is a beautiful image source from a dear friend and conservationist, Sean Gracer. And today's case study about sugar into fat and hummingbirds. Now, the ruby-throated hummingbird's range is roughly this orange kind of ellipses or ellipse or whatever um, that is hovering over the eastern United States. Now, that's where it summers, but in the wintertime, basically right now, birds are migrating south. And you can see, basically, to get to their Latin American wintering grounds, these birds fly straight across the Gulf of Mexico. Now, that's about 500 miles, like, diagonally. Now, how these birds achieve this is fascinating. So again, if we look at our map, as after they fly across the 500 miles, they land on the Yucatan Peninsula, and they are pretty fatigued and low on energy. But their journey isn't over. And our study is going to take us down to the Nicoya Peninsula in northwest Costa Rica, where I was fortunate to participate in a biological research project uh, with Sean and his dear friend Tyler at uh, a spot called Cobano, Costa Rica on the Nicoya in 2013. And here we were banding a variety of birds, and some of the birds that we were banding and monitoring were hummingbirds, specifically the ruby-throated hummingbird. And the goal of the project here was to ascertain and begin to understand the overwintering um, habits and behavior of ruby throated hummingbirds. And so what we were doing is we were mist netting um, using a very unique contraption set up around a, basically a feeding array of, um, an array of hummingbird feeders. And we would safely and legally and professionally and scientifically capture these hummingbirds and place a very small little bracelet with a unique serial number on there. That is a very crude form of basically monitoring these birds. So if we ever recaptured this bird, we could take a look at its number and compare it to our data. And it turns out we had actually banded this specific bird three years prior, and it had returned back to Costa Rica to its wintering grounds. So what that means is that if this bird had been banded three years prior, it had made a minimum of six journeys up, down, up, down, up, down. And it had survived this, this harrowing journey. Now, here's a little slow-mo release of a ruby-throated hummingbird just to show that they are good to go after we ban them. And, oh, whoops. Hello, world. And so what I want to drive home is that basically these hummingbirds, what they'll do is before they migrate, they'll fill up like crazy. Remember, as if you were going on a road trip, you would fill up your gas tank all the way. And then if you have a smarter car or a newer car, it would say 310 miles till fill up. And basically the hummingbirds are the same way, but instead of burning the sugar, they basically store the sugar as fat under, on their throat, on, like in the, on their furculum, on their, underneath their wings or near their vents. Now, if you've ever processed a chicken or like cooked a whole chicken, you can see the fat that's stored on their body. And so this fat basically burns like you would like burn up gasoline in a car and allows the hummingbird to make this basically open water journey across the Gulf of Mexico for a bird that weighs about three and a half grams. Now, as we continue to explore the amazing adaptations and abilities, we're gonna tie this uh, case study into another location in Northwestern North America. Now, orcas live here, Arctic terns live here, bald eagles live here, and you guessed it folks, we are heading north to Alaska. Now, I spent three summers living and working in Alaska and I saw hummingbirds, folks, believe it or not, and if you were lucky during your time there, you may have seen the delightfully dapper Rufus Hummingbird. Um, now, the Rufus Hummingbird, here is another angle, is found within this region. And the Rufus Hummingbird basically winters in the blue area, migrates through the yellow area, and is found in its breeding range in the orange area. Now, for those of us who are potentially map disoriented, 
here's us down here and here is Alaska. Now, as you can see, their range basically goes into BC and into kind of southeastern Alaska. And these hummingbirds are long distance migrant and they employ a very similar, basically the same strategy. They fuel up before they head up north and they burn their fat along the way. Now, these birds aren't making an open ocean journey like the ruby throated, so potentially they could fuel up a little bit along the way. Now, it's about 4,000 miles from their winching grounds in Mexico to the northwestern part of their range in Alaska, which is pretty crazy for a bird that weighs only a couple grams. Now, here's again the Rufus hummingbird. And what's so special about this bird is that it actually has a very special relationship with two flower species in, that are found throughout the West, but also found in Alaska. Now, as we look here, this uh, gray area over on our map is basically the range of this a specific species of Indian paintbrush. Um, and the genus is Castaleja for our botanist amongst us. And here's what this looks like. There's a variety of species, but we're just talking about this one in particular. And as I keep clicking right, you're going to see the, the range map of the Rufus hummingbird superimposed on top of the range map of the Indian paintbrush. Now, as you see, oops, as you can see, the range map of the Rufus hummingbird and the Indian paintbrush is nearly identical. And that's because the Indian paintbrush, along with Western Columbine and the Rufus hummingbird, have basically slowly migrated, basically slowly um, expanded their range north as, temp as temperatures have been suitable for them to expand. And that's only because the hummingbirds, the Rufus hummingbirds, are pollinating the Indian paintbrush. And so over thousands of years, the Indian paintbrush and the Western Columbine have moved north with the Rufus hummingbird. And so you're not going to see, so as you can see again, look closely at the range here as basically really tying in the connection here. You can see that really specific overlap, and that's not a coincidence. So again, reviewing the map of the long distance migrants, 4,000 miles from Mexico to Alaska. And like I said, sometimes they get up to Alaska and the weather's not great. Um, this is from kind of southeastern Alaska area. And hummingbirds have to be able to, to hang it, hang out there. Like I said, they're mostly tropical in origin. And as the weather permitted, they migrate, as climate change and warmed, it basically allowed them to expand their range north, but it still can get really cold some nights. And so they have a unique adaptation to drop their internal temperature um, for us science people um, from 40 degrees Celsius to 18 degrees Celsius. Or if we're talking Fahrenheit, it's from 104 degrees Fahrenheit to 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, this is not exactly hibernation, but it's similar, and it's called nighttime torpor. And torpor is basically just a turned down version of hibernation. And so basically, just like you would set your thermostat in your home to 68 degrees or whatever, a nice comfortable temperature, um, the hummingbirds can set their internal thermostat to a much lower temperature. Now, that's, that basically allows them to turn their basal metabolic, it basically allows them to shift their BSR or their BSM, their basal me metabolic rate. So if you're burning at 104 degrees Fahrenheit, you're going to eat up a lot more fuel and you're going to be able to be more agile and move more quickly. But at 64 degrees, you're basically on like a chill mode. You are basically very passed out and uh, just hunkering down. So you're burning less calories than you would, which allows the hummingbirds to overcome these really uh, cold temperatures and low pressure fronts that can move in um, sometimes out of nowhere in Alaska. So again, nighttime torpor. Now, what's so fascinating amongst many things about hummingbirds and flowers is their co-evolution and how tricky these flowers are. Now, if you look at this awesome little cutout from Sibley Guide to Bird Behavior, um, there's a little image that shows the four different flowers and where they place their anthers um, on the flowers so that it does not get mixed up with other flower pollen and so that their pollen gets safely distributed to the respective flowers. So as you can see, the fuchsias, um, they deposit their pollen kind of under the beak or the chin of the hummingbirds. And then if you're looking at pinks, um, like the cardinal catchfly or any other 
flowers that look similar to this. It's actually being stored kind of along the beak and at the base of the bill. And then if we look at the ocotillos found in kind of the desert southwest, kind of southeast of us, um, it places it on kind of the forecrown and a little bit on the face. And then lastly, if we're looking at the chuparrosas, um, you can see that basically the anthers are extend far enough to place the pollen on the top of the head. And as you can see, none of these locations overlap with one another. So these hummingbirds could be actually visiting four, you know, in this diagram, four different flower species and their pollen and the pollen would be kind of nicely organized. All right. So as we dive into South America, we are heading up into the Andes and we're going to explore high elevation hummingbirds like this great sapphire wing. Now, high elevation hummingbirds are adapted amazingly to living with low oxygen levels in the atmosphere. Now, this picture was taken at about 9,000 feet. And now if we look at this amazing chart that basically shows us our altitude in either feet or meters and the effect of oxygen, basically how much oxygen is available for consumption or uptake, we can see that it shifts dramatically as we go up in elevation. So when we drop the bar down to 9,000 feet, we can see that of what the roughly 21% of oxygen that would be available to us has, at sea level has dropped to about 14.8%. Now, okay, that's not crazy, but it is, it is certainly insubstantial. And 9,000 feet um, for reference is above Aspen, Colorado. So many of us will get out of breath even walking around there. Take, for example, the fiery-throated hummingbird, a gorgeous hummingbird found in the highlands of Costa Rica. It's also found up to 9,000. Okay, so pretty similar. It's existing with that 15% of effective oxygen in the air. But now if we jump up um, another 3,000 feet in elevation to visit the rainbow-bearded thornbill in the Paramo um, or the tropical alpine habitat of Ecuador, um, we can see very quickly that again, as you go up another 3,000 feet, the effect of oxygen is only 13.2%. Now, if we visit the giant hummingbird, and a really interesting example, because it's found from sea level in the Andes up to nearly 15,000 feet. Now, the giant hummingbird, if we look at its oxy available oxygen at 15,000, it barely has 12% of the oxygen available. Um, which is amazing. Now, how do birds like these hummingbirds who have such insane requirements, like we talked about their metabolic needs, their flying, their vision, how do they survive with such little oxygen? Well, the answer is that they have unique hemoglobin um, that have enhanced oxygen binding properties. So it's basically like if you have a sedan, you can only put so much stuff in your car. But if you have a pickup truck, you can put a whole lot in your pickup bed. And so hemoglobin that we have, for example, only allows a certain amount of oxygen to bind to it. But hemoglobin that is evolved in hummingbirds basically allows a lot more oxygen to bind to it so that the hummingbirds can store the oxygen within their muscle tissue and um, allows them to survive, which is very, very interesting for this giant hummingbird given that it can persist, like we've mentioned, up to 15,000 feet and is also found at sea level. Now, one thing that we love to talk about is feather iridescence. And well, there's a lot of hummingbirds in our realm that have it, like this wire-crested thorntail and this uh, <laughs> forget the coronet on this one. There's a lot of hummingbird species. This is, it'll come to me. Um, so Basically, how does this happen? Because sometimes you'd be looking at a hummingbird and you get your binos on and you're like, oh my gosh, it's a black-throated hummingbird um, or a black-chained hummingbird. That's so exciting. I didn't know they were here. And then it turns around to you and then you see the magenta kind of pink throat and you're like, oh, I got fooled. It was an anise hummingbird. And the reason for that is that hummingbirds can basically kind of turn on or turn off those like bright colors that you're seeing. And that's because light is actually refracting, like as you can see through this, like if you were to hold a prism up to the light, or as you see on the Pink Floyd cover album, um, it basically goes from white light to a myriad of colors or a rainbow. And so that has to do with our viewing angle. And so as hummingbirds adjust and turn different directions, um, they can basically adjust the viewing angle for other birds. So whether signaling to females or other, to other males, 
um, they can basically turn it on or turn it off. And when they turn it off, when they change their angle, it allows them to kind of blend in and not be as uh, conspicuous. And so again, at the most simple level, light is refracting through microscopic structures of the feather barbules. So we could get into this a whole lot more, but um, we have some more cool things that I want to talk about a little bit more locally. Now, here's California. Here's a map. And here's where we are in Santa Barbara. And here's where I am over here in Los Angeles. Now in California, we can reliably observe six different species. And I'm not talking about um, crazy vagrants or anything like that. Um, so this is an Anna's hummingbird I photographed in the Angeles National Forest. Here's an Allen's hummingbird photographed at my local hotspot here in the San Fernando Valley on some native golden current. Here's a Rufus hummingbird I sourced from Jesse Bryan. Here is the dashing and wine colored Calliope hummingbird from the Macaul Macaulay Library. Um, here's our black chin hummingbird that we spoke about and the Costas hummingbird. Now, a huge part of what I want to get into next is basically how to attract hummingbirds into your yard. Now, I'm sure we go bird watch, all of us probably go bird watching and watch nature shows. And what better than to go bird watching and have a nature show right outside your door? Now, in this next section, I'll share some awesome tips how to attract hummingbirds into your backyard. Now, a lot of folks may have the misconception that native plants just aren't beautiful. And unfortunately, that is just a misconception. And so here we have a couple native plants. So basically what I wanna share is that native plants, you can plant a variety so that you always have something that's basically flowering in your garden. So in January and through March, uh, these are the flowers that will bloom in our gardens. So a variety of currants and gooseberries in the, gro in the Gracularaceae and the family and the Ribes genus. So again, this is the Allen's hummingbird with the golden current. And this is the pink chaparral current, the Ribes malvasium. And then also, believe it or not, cacti often bloom in January through March. So this is a beaver tail cactus. This is a type of Opuntia. And here's another Opuntia below it. And on the right, we have the monkey flowers. Um, their genus was recently changed to Dipactus. Um, but there's a variety of different color forms that you can get, um, as well as different species that do well in our um, Mediterranean climates. And as we get into like our proper summer season, um, we have a variety of flowers that are blooming. Um, these are all in the mint family. These are salvias. This is uh, Cleveland, I believe is it purple or Cleveland sage up top. And then we have the hummingbird pitcher sage. And then we have some beautiful penstemons as you can see this really red tubular flower. Um, and then another beautiful penstemon below it, different color. And then thistles, we actually have some beautiful native thistles like the bull thistle um, and some awesome other colorful flowers like these snapdragons that hummingbirds love. Um, and that's the island bush snapdragon. Now, you may be wondering, where can I source native plants in my area? Because I know that October is coming up and which is basically like the prime time season for incorporating native plants into your garden. Now, one of the best places in kind of the central coast area is actually the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. And I'm sure you guys do bird walks there or visited there, um, but they're doing amazing, amazing work. They have a, a deep team of biological researchers that inventory for rare and threatened plants. Um, I know one gentleman there, who Adam Searcy, who's a fantabulous birder. Um, and so if you're looking to get in touch with Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, um, they are right in town in Santa Barbara. Um, and here's their contact. And I'm sure we could share the link if you haven't been there. Um, it's an amazing place to go, and they also have a nursery, like I said, where you can purchase and support the work that they're doing and create wildlife habitat in your backyard, because I feel like a lot of us know, but native plants are really special. They require less water. They don't require any pesticides. They are uniquely adapted to our local ecology. They promote a wide variety of invertebrates, and they look amazing in the garden. No space to plant, no worries folks. You can also in view hummingbirds in your yard by throwing up some hummingbird feeders. And even if you live in a small place like an apartment, you could even slap this up on the outside of your window. As you can see the little suction cups, 
Now, you may stop into the pet store and you see this amazing big old bottle of hummingbird necks and you think to yourself, oh, premium concentrate? Yes, please. Or you're in the next pet food store and you're like, ooh, red nectar mix for hummingbirds. I don't mind if I do. Made in America? What could be better? Or you see this delicious bottle of Petco hummingbird nectar in a handy little water bottle and you think, which one of these should I get? And let me answer that quickly. Don't get that one. Don't get that one. Don't get that one. Wait a second. You said don't get any of these. I know, folks. No red dye premix. Please. Solution? Yes, we've got one for you. You can make your own solution. Now, I'm about to share my great, 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 great grandmother's secret recipe for hummingbird nectar. It turns out it's also the standard recipe. Now, it's a 20% nectar solution, which means that it's a ratio of one to four of sugar to water. So total is five parts, meaning one in five is 20%. So if you put one cup of sugar, you should put four cups of water, and then make sure to use warm water to evenly dissolve the sugar and make sure to clean your feeders frequently. Um, some folks say around three days, but depending on the temperature, um, the sugar water can actually ferment and kind of turn alcoholic. Um, and the hummingbirds, it turns out, do not like that. So make sure to swap that water out for them, that sugar water out for them. And now is actually a really time to get it going. And it turns out the more hummingbird feeders you have in your yard, actually the more hummingbirds you'll attract. And whether that's single port feeders or like a big circular dish, the more feeders you have, the more hummers you'll get to see. And it'll take a little while for them to notice, but once they do, they are gonna come knocking. And it turns out we have reached just about the terminus of the things I had in mind for you guys. And uh, once again, my name is Benny, um, or Birds by Beaches. And uh, I can't always guarantee that we see birds on our outings, but I can guarantee a very good time. And if you wanted to check out some of the things I mentioned, like local tours or photography outings, um, you can hit me up on my social media things, or you can just hop on my website and check out birdsbybeaches.com. And thank you guys so much for your rapt attention. I'm going to stop my share and I'm going to pass it over to Teresa who will do what she does best. Benny, thank you. That was fantastic. Second time through, I learned more and I'm sure everyone loved it. It was very informative and very in entertaining. So thanks again. Um, we do have, a, just wanted to remind everybody, we'll have a few minutes for Q&A, so we do have a few questions, but if you want to ask a question, go ahead and go into the chat and submit it, and we will ask Benny. But Benny, I wanted to um, take the opportunity to mention, because you focus so much on the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, that... Um, to remind everybody that this November program is um, with Scott Pipkin from the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. He's going to give a program on supporting birds using native plants in your garden. So there you go. No idea that was coming. I just did my research on local botanical areas and I felt like, you know, I know some folks up there and I know they do an amazing, amazing job. So I'm sure you guys are well connected. So yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's gonna be a, a good program. Um, okay, our first question was from Bobby. She said, why are hummingbirds only in the Western Hemisphere? Um, good question, Bobby. And that is because they are so recently evolved, basically after the continent split, basically like, you know, Pangea was basically one like Gondwanda land, it was basically one land mass. And so over time, as it split, hummingbirds actually evolved. And so they evolved in, in basically the Western Hemisphere. And so in the Old World or the Eastern Hemisphere, we have a whole different groups of birds um, that visit flowers that are called sunbirds. So I don't know if you've been to Africa or to India or to Nepal or any places like that, um, or to Southeast Asia, you'll see a variety of sunbird species, which basically take the ecological, take basically are 
occupy the ecological niche of hummingbirds in the old world and the hummingbirds in our new world, you know, basically do all the things that I shared. So it has to do with the continent when the continents, continents split. Okay, great. Um, Ginny wonders, how do they come out of torpor? Mm, it's a good question. Um, I haven't been asked that, but I would presume that it basically has to do with uh, light cues. Like as basically as the sun's starting to come up, they basically are like, oh, they come out of their little like chrysalis and they start to like shift their, their own physio, like their own internal physiology. Birds are crazy sensitive. Um, I haven't been asked that question specifically, so I can't give like a hundred percent definite answer. Um, but I would say it's probably light cues and external temperatures that start to, as the temperature starts to change, basically their internal clock will shift and they're like, okay, it's time to come out of torpor. And then they go feed immediately because they're basically on like running on E. Great. Thank you. What is the highest calorie native plant for, for hummers? Jan asks. Oh, that's a good question and a very specific one, Jan. Um, I don't know. Honestly, hummingbirds, like, short answer, I don't know if there's, like, one plant that has, like, the highest calorie. I feel like ne like the nectar that, hum that plants produce is probably similarly um, calorie dense. I know that they do, like, what I would say if you're interested, what I'm hearing the question is how do I provide the best quality food for hummingbirds in my garden using native plants? I would say planting a variety, um, I would say, like I said, planting a variety of plants that bloom in different months will allow them to have like a constant source of nectar. Um, and then obviously having the hummingbird feeders to kind of augment maybe like a non-flowering time um, so they could get their supplement that way. Okay, and Bobby is, as a follow-up to that, she's saying in line about cal caloric contact, content, are all nectars equal in calories? Boy, these are these are birders. These are specific folks. <laughs> these are really good questions. I appreciate that. Um, I would have to like dig into some research papers because I don't think <laughs> that's very very specific information that I have not exposed myself to. But I certainly will not get that question again and not know the answer. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a very technical question that would involve some like. Uh, some research tools that I don't have, but I could research the people who use those tools in their research and get back to you guys. Janet, uh, Janet's iPad Pro 2020 says, what LA County gardens would you recommend? Theodore uh, Payne, question mark. Yeah, so I assume you're asking about nurseries. Um, there's three that I would recommend. Um, let me pull up that slide. I'm glad I left it in there. Um, so there's three that I recommend heavily here in Los Angeles. Um, the most famous and well-known is certainly the Theodore Payne Foundation. They are absolute pioneers um, for native plants. They've been around for 60 years and they are the OGs when it comes to native plants and kind of pushing that agenda. Um, but another amazing native plant nursery that does a lot of restoration and conservation work um, is the Ha Hamong the Native Plant Nursery in Pasadena. Uh, and then if you're in like the Northeast LA area, kind of in the city, this is a smaller, cute little nursery that does natives as well. This is called the Artemisia Nursery. So um, either of these are definitely a really good bet. Okay, great. Um, I'm wondering, do you know how long it would typically take a Rufus hummingbird to make that 4,000 mile journey? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know offhand, but definitely at, at least a couple weeks. Like um, in the spring, they might get up there a little bit slower, taking their time. Because um, basically, the migration in general for birds is like, like, I don't know, it depends on species, but hummingbirds, I, I'm sure in the springtime, they kind of take a little bit slower time just so that they don't burn out by the time they get up there. But again, I don't have, I don't have that answer again. I'm going to, I'm going to look that one up, but it's probably a couple of weeks, I would guess. Mm -hmm. um, and then 
in terms of migration, Layla's iPad asks, in the ruby throat that crosses the Gulf of Mexico, do researchers know if they sleep on the surface of the ocean or they fly straight? They fly straight across. Remarkable. Yeah. Remarkable. Um, we got a chat from Martha Luce. Great presentation. Regards from Guatemala. How wonderful. <laughs> Somebody from Guatemala. Um, and they ask, um, does, do hummingbirds feed at the same places? I'm not sure if that is to interpret to return to the same place, however you'd like to interpret that. Yeah, so good question. So yes, yes. So there's a couple different, like, so in my backyard, for example, I've got a bunch of hummingbird feeders. And so they're definitely coming back to the same feeders. Um, but it's basically wherever the sugar is. So if you have like a yard, if you have like a bunch of flowers in your yard that they're coming to, like, yes, they come back. And also, like I said about like the, the hummingbirds as they migrate, birds are very, they very high sight fidelity. Um, basically what that means is that they might like the, the same hummingbird, like you start, maybe you'll see Rufus hummingbirds wintering in our backyards locally. Um, it's probably the same individual that you've been seeing year in and year out, just like the same hooded orioles are coming back to your palm trees to breed in the summer or whatever. It's like, if those were color banded, you would be able to see like, oh, that's like Joe Schmo, he's back again. So in terms of migrants, yes, they are very loyal to the same areas. And then resident hummingbird species, like we talked about, uh, the white tip sickle bill as like a trap liner. It basically has its like paper route or its flower route that it uses to go through the forest and then it generally resides there. Tropical, tropical species are very complex because some birds are year round residents in the tropics and they'll, and they live there. And then, but, and then some of them are actually what we call altitudinal migrants. So as opposed to like going up latitudinally, like we saw in the ruby throated hummingbird or the rufous hummingbird, they're actually migrating up and down the slope of the mountain based on seasonality and basically the flowering patterns of the plants in each of those communities. So maybe during like the wet season, for example, they would go down slope. And then during the drier part of the year, they would head up slope where a lot of those flowers are um, in bloom and producing nectar. Bobby uh, added a chat here anecdotally. Great. Uh, seems like the same Rufus uh, hummingbirds take possession of their same citrus tree every year. Yes, so they're very strict. She's seeing that. <laughs> okay, great. She also added that um, you can get uh, sugar really cheap at Costco. Boom. So um, it's looking like I don't see any new questions. So I think, is there anything else you want to add, Benny? Um, well, I just wanted to add also just, you know, I recently um, have taken a new position as a director of an educational nonprofit here in Los Angeles. Um, and so it's called BioCitizen Los Angeles. And a huge part of what I do is obviously like the bird education and the guiding and the photography. Um, and I've also pivoted like I said, pivoted towards residing full-time in Los Angeles. And so our program is basically an amazing opportunity to cultivate what we call place-based learning. And so we're a walking program. And so we take kids on hikes. And so we do like, we talk about native plants. We talk about indigenous California history. We talk about birds. We talk about um, plant identification. We talk about survival skills. We, use, we do nature journaling and illustration. And so it's basically kind of like a, a young naturalist program paired with survival skills as well as kind of um, individual growth and land steward and conservation. And so right now we're, we've just finished a 10 week um, in-person summer program and we had about 40 kids each week um, from ages five to 13. And so they're all broken up into groups of 10 kids and two instructors. And, and then now we basically, I just rolled out this awesome new program called like our after school enrichment program, which is basically a bite sized version of our summer camp day that allows kids to continue to connect with our local areas. And so it's about two and a half hours from three to 530. So after their zoom time and their virtual classes, they can come out and wear their masks and, you know, be COVID cool and run around and today um, I was supervising a group in Santa Monica and we were up in Will Rogers State Park and we were hiking and exploring and looking at cacti and like sharing that observation I mentioned today about the Anna's hummingbird and the 
the cactus fruit. So just if that's if that if you guys know folks in Los Angeles that have you know kids or you know recent college students that are interested in getting involved in this really unique opportunity, um, feel free to reach out to Teresa and she can put you in contact with me. Um, and we're also a nonprofit, so we are uh, trying to increase our equity of access to obviously support a, diver, a equally diverse community that is here in Los Angeles and. Uh, in years to come, we will probably expand south to like San Diego County and like up north into like Ojai, Ventura and Santa Barbara. So keep your ears to the streets for that folks. Thank you. Thank you for that good work. It's so important to be with the youth and help them catch the conservation bug and the love of nature and the importance to protect it. So thank you so much. Got to start them young. Yes, that's right. Okay, we have one more te just very technical question. Um, I mean, a nuts and bolts question. How often do you clean the feeder? Is it safely safe to put them in dishwasher? And I'm, I'm assuming it has to do with whether how hot it is, whether it's in the sun and all of that. But what would you say? Yeah, I would say I would say I just usually rinse them with hot, like with just kind of hot water, just kind of rinse them out. Like I have some, a bunch of single port feeders and then like some dishes. So I just like also like I'll soap and water my dish. And then sometimes I'll like soap and like I'll soap and scrub out the, whatever cleaning modality you use, just make sure that it's absolutely cool and clean and there's no soap residue on your feeder so that the hummingbirds don't get soaked up. But you know, you'll know basically depending on how, what type of feeder you get. You can get like the really nice glass ones or the ornamental ones, or you can get the cheap kind of like lightweight plastic ones. Either way, just, you know, be mindful that plastic does melt under heat. So just, you know, I wouldn't put like scalding water on it. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, let's wrap up. And uh, I would love to give a couple um, parting notes. And Benny, thank you so much for an excellent uh, presentation. It was it was just great, and what a great way to start off the. Um, I just say something. Don't use organic. Sugars. Don't use organic sugars. Okay. A note to not use organic sugars. How come? I think we might be confusing like organic raw, uh, like raw cane sugar with like right. No, 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 organic. I think we have a clarification. It's not the organic. It is actually it's the it is iron in raw that is the problem. From Phil K to everybody. So to everybody, it is. <laughs> if you're gonna make that claim, you have to have a very serious, uh, I think, uh, evidence so we can look that up and stay informed. But. Um, I love the community yeah. activism going on. Yes, thank you everyone for your concern. So um, uh, so just to let everybody know, um, we recorded the presentation and it will be made available on our website, santabarbaraaudubon.org. And so more, more information on that to come. Our next program will be exactly four weeks from now on Wednesday, October 28th on alternatives to rodenticides. The presenters will be Joel and Keon Schulman, who founded and are still very active in the organization Poison Free in Malibu. They will be co-presenting with wildlife biologist and National Parks staffer, Kathy Schoonmacher. And we hope to see you there. We had um, 100 people on this call, I mean, this meeting. I think we might've had to turn a few away um, it's, it's a good problem to have. I'm glad we recorded it and I hope folks can find it in the future. But thank you all so much. It was so great to have such a great turnout. And uh, so thanks for coming and have a good night. Take care, everybody.